About 20 years ago at our wedding, our theme song was called If I Fall Behind, Wait For Me by Bruce Springsteen. We both ran marathons in those days, and it was a symbol of things long-term, a reminder that life is not a sprint, and we should always wait for each other along life's way. This was difficult at the time because my wife was really like the ever ready bunny. No shortage of energy and or commitments. Book me early, she would say. As the years went by, we both slowed down, but the last five years for her were really a trial. The energy decreased and the search for answers why increased. And that's the worst part, not knowing what the heck is wrong. Is there an illness? If so, what is the source? What's the cure? Each new drug would promise a better outcome but the drugs were really just a mask, not a cure. This is almost a, a death spiral of living. There's no way to comprehend the depth of depression and desperation as you watch your lifelong partner fall behind and become someone so different than the person you used to know. And yet sometimes the bunny does return and you hope she merely fell behind and it was just a slow spot while she was catching her breath during a much longer race, which has no finish line. I had once lived an active and healthy lifestyle. I traveled and I ran marathons. I've hiked, I've climbed, I've biked, I've trekked throughout the world. But eventually, I just about gave up as I struggled to get through the day without pain. The first time that I noticed something was up, I happened to be visiting Nancy at her home and she was running to the doctor to get some paperwork done so she could go on an international trip. And I could tell that, that her sense you know, with the doctor was different. She had opened up about privacy and other things she needed for the trip. And it seemed to me that there was you know, potentially something more to the story. She had always been very athletic, outside, running. And I could tell that she didn't have the energy that she used to. She wasn't really saying much originally. She really keeps things very you know, private. This is a, a, a person who has been fit all her life, uh, whether it was running, swimming, volleyball, uh, hiking, biking, you name it, to have, having trouble going up the stairs in the house. My journey began with a rash, and soon the tests and the biopsies began. And the endless list of possible diagnoses was thoroughly explored, one by one, ruled out. It wasn't Lyme disease, it wasn't lupus, it wasn't leprosy, and it wasn't something that I picked up on one of my trips in China, India, or Africa. It wasn't malaria, it wasn't valley fever. The list of what it wasn't grew with each passing test and each visit to another doctor and specialist. It was incredibly frustrating to not be able to help Nancy, and she was so experienced and so positive. She was wonderful with regard to sharing what she learned, but to be blunt, she wasn't learning much. She was learning what it wasn't. She was frustrated that so many people had offered opinions. So I was really pleased to be able to listen, but it was, it was difficult. The physical embodiment of the disease was really starting to show. And you can hear about something you know, time and time again, but then to have the visual as well really drove home that this was a, a big problem. There's this acute accumulation of symptoms too. I mean, to go from waking up in the morning where your hands are numb, uh, to have aching joints everywhere, uh, to having issues with your vision, uh, all of this on top of the skin lesions. On Nancy's good days, it's, um, you know, well, I wasn't shaky when I got up this morning, and my head feeling in my hands, so it's a good day. Or I'm going to go ride my bike, so that'll make it a good day. And the symptoms, they never went away. My eyelids twitched, I had more rashes, ear pain, nose pain, open skin lesions, and shortness of breath. My jaw deteriorated, I had terrible pain, crowns, and root canals. My blood work was sent to Florida, Minnesota, New York, and all over the state of California. There were some real low points as Nancy went to doctor after doctor and, and didn't get information that she was looking for. And it was especially discouraging because these were world-class organizations, UCLA, Mayo Clinic. To have her be afflicted with this 
and to realize that nobody kind of understood what was going on or that there was possibly no cure, um, it just didn't make sense. I deal with uncertainty uh, every day um, in my, my line of work, um, and I can accept that. But when you come home and realize that it's uncertainty that uh, could be the proverbial life and death here, it's a whole different thing. Endless appointments and medical examinations, including grand rounds, moved forward with very little resolution in sight. The poking, the testing, the pain, the fatigue all continued. I wanted to hide, and I wanted to suffer out of view of everyone, but there was still no diagnosis. One of the hardest parts was discovering that no one believed that I really didn't know what was wrong with me. If you think about the primary care physician meeting the patient for the first time, uh, they're there to help, they're there to make a diagnosis, and it is very frustrating to not have the knowledge or the testing available to them that would allow them to identify this disease before patients go through two or three years of doctor shopping and being told, well, you don't have this, I don't know what you have, and oftentimes I think doubting whether these problems they have are real or not. As Nancy was visiting more doctors and not getting answers, it was you know, very frustrating you know, for, for her. We, I was very pleased that she didn't give up. The diagnosis is often complicated by the fact that uh, common diseases also cause arthritis and painful joints and a skin rash. And th these pose problems for the patient and the doctor in making a diagnosis. When we're in medical school, we're taught when we, we think of different diagnoses and we hear hoofbeats, we should think of horses, uh, not the rare zebra. And so while doctors spend three years investigating all of the horses, it takes a pretty special person to figure out that this case is indeed one of those zebras that only comes around once in a very rare time, and uh, that, that's usually a, a special doctor or a, a special uh, collection of uh, symptoms that occurred just at the right time to suggest the right diagnosis. Epiphany often occurs when the doctor hears the story of how both ears are involved, and oftentimes it's the, the, that signal because there aren't too many diseases where the ears are involved, become inflammatory, become red and painful. And that's often a signal that leads to a detailed story. You uncover many other uh, symptoms that have come and gone over time, and that often is the, what helps make the final diagnosis. So what did I have? Nancy was diagnosed with relapsing polychondritis, which is a very rare and unusual autoimmune disease. It affects on the order of three to five people per million and is very protean in its effects. It's a disease where the body turns on itself and cells of our immune system attack the cells in our own body. In relapsing polychondritis, they specifically attack cells that uh, have cartilage in and around the area. Once Nancy got her diagnosis, you know, we immediately started to find out what we could and it was in fairly short order if you realize that there wasn't much information out there. It was hard to find almost anything that was relevant, even the basics. What was it? What caused it? What were the treatments? You know, what, was the, um, what was the anticipated you know, impact on how long she was going to live? It was, it, it was very shocking, uh, and it was a real dose of reality quickly. Being an extraordinarily rare illness, relapsing polychondritis is not familiar to most physicians out in the community. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the average doctor will never ever see a case of relapsing polychondritis in their normal practice. Most of these patients will, once diagnosed, find their way to someone in the rheumatology field. These are the physicians that spend their time uh, studying diseases of an autoimmune nature, particularly those that affect the joints, connective tissue like relapsing polychondritis does. But even those physicians will have very little experience managing patients with this disease. Big sigh of relief. We've got a name for it, relapsing polychondritis. So you instantly become uh, an expert uh, looking up everything that's ever been written about it. 
And what you find out is, yeah, there, are, <laughs> there is no cure at this point because uh, it's such a limited set of folks that uh, have encountered the disease. Uh, the outcomes are not positive uh, because think of it, we're talking about the cartilage in your body. <laughs> there, 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 there almost is not a place within your body that you don't have cartilage of one kind or another, whether it's your ear, your nose, uh, your, uh, around your throat, your heart. Um, for lack of a better phrase, it certainly doesn't give you a warm and fuzzy feeling uh, looking forward when all of these little uh, quirks in your everyday life are tearing you apart. Relapsing polychondritis involves many different areas of our body. Uh, probably the most common area uh, uh, involved are, are the ears, the cartilage in our ears, and patients complain of, 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 of pain and crackling in, in the ears. The, uh, fatty part of the ears is normally unaffected. It's the cartilage uh, that uh, turns red and becomes painful. The bridge of our nose is often uh, affected because there's lots of cartilage there. Joints are lined by cartilage. The, the trachea or our windpipe is often uh, affected and can cause difficulty breathing. You can have effects on the voice. Skin is not uncommonly involved in relapsing polychondritis, and in serious cases, the blood vessels can be affected, and in the most serious cases, the largest blood vessel in our body, the aorta, can be affected, and the strength of the lining of the aorta can be weakened by this disease. Triggers are not well known. Uh, oftentimes, these things occur rather acutely and without much warning, and uh, just like we don't understand what triggers the illness, we do not understand the underlying cause of relapsing polychondritis. To put a name to the mystery that was my life brought a sense of relief, but no treatment and no cure. Relapsing polychondritis is more commonly known as RP. It is so rare that most people and most doctors have no idea what it is. I remember her telling me, obviously, you know, that it was sensitive on her ears and her nose and then as the cartilage broke down and the trachea and we started talking about what that all meant and I really thought that her time was limited and I think that that's when it dawned on me that I couldn't lose her in my life. This was probably a year ago uh, you know I was like well I'm gonna make my plans until September of whatever year that was, and then I'm checking out. And it's like, whoa, time out. We don't talk like that. The natural history of relapsing polychondritis can be very variable from patient to patient. And many people suffer from recurrences, uh, remissions, and relapses over many years. But in instances where very important organs are involved, such as the, the, the trachea, the, the windpipe, or the large, large blood vessel, the aorta that leaves our heart, this can be a life-threatening illness and uh, poses uh, extraordinary treatment challenges for both the physician and the patient. The current treatment for relapsing polychondritis is to suppress the immune system. The thought is if you can turn off these reactive lymphocytes, they would stop making the uh, cytokines and other inflammatory mediators that they make that cause tissue. And we have many different ways in which to turn off the immune system, but unfortunately, they're all relatively nonspecific. It became clear that there really weren't any answers, but I detected a slight change in my sister that I knew was coming. And that was, if she couldn't help herself and couldn't get exactly what she was looking for, that she could help other people get to those answers. And it came when we were just talking about who she talked to, who she met with, what they said, and having had you know, high expectations. And talking about that long journey, which she stayed tough through the whole time, it was really wonderful when it became clear that she was gonna turn this around and she was gonna do everything in her power to help other, other folks, patients, and other families that were dealing with this. And at that point, Nancy realized I need to make, I need to bring this to light. I need to not only tell my family, but I need to get the message out there. And I need to start sharing the information that I've been gathering for the last 
you know, five, six years and bring this cause, you know, into the spotlight. Given her position in life, uh, her resources, uh, her outgoing nature, what the heck, let's, let's turn this around. Let's get a little more positive, uh, less fatalistic. Um, not necessarily, uh, I mean, sure, you hope you find a cure or you hope you can, uh, you know, move the, the proverbial football a little bit further down the field in terms of finding a cure, or doing more research, but let's at least get the facts out to some folks who may feel a little bit better if they know what they have and uh, not necessarily what stage they may be at or, or um, quality of life they have, but at least to get that uh, fact in front of them. Uh, and then, you know, uh, you know it, it takes a village or whatever, get more folks involved. My journey back began with a decision. It was a decision to tell my story. It was a deliberate decision. It was a decision which again changed my life. Somehow I mustered up all the courage to realize that there is no cure for RP, but I'm still alive and I can use what breath I have to live with purpose. After that decision, I allowed my doctors to talk about my case openly and honestly, wherever and whenever they needed. The field suffers from lack of attention. Lack of attention is not uncommon with a rare disease. If you think about uh, deciding you wanted to study relapsing polychondritis and you know that only three or five patients out of every million are going to get the disease, you, you'd have to be in a big city, you'd have to set up a referral center uh, to answer these questions. We, we need to be able to do that. We need doctors working together. We need patients working together. Oh, some fields have solved these problems by forming networks because the only way to develop new therapies is to understand the disease process and then get patients treated in like manners, follow the outcomes of the results, discard therapies that don't work, work harder on therapies that do work. And oftentimes this comes by the formation of networks. They can be formed by doctors, they can be formed by volunteer groups, often uh, driven by patients who are affected and become frustrated by the lack of options, the, the lack of uh, information out there for their disease. But with that uh, um, approach, uh, a, with a focus on bringing patients and interested doctors together, you can move the entire field forward. I am now a part of a very small and growing community, and we are fully committed to finding the cause, identifying the gene, developing specific tests, and creating a drug to treat or maybe even cure this disease. It's rare, so what? We are guinea pigs, it's okay. We are on the front line, and we're going to fight tooth and nail to raise awareness. We're going to help the medical community bring this disease to the forefront. We're going to support and encourage research in any way we can. Uh, she'll be an advocate. Uh, she'll be a, um, a junkyard dog, a, a killer uh, attack on this uh, uh, disease or this cause. I've always been inspired by my sister, and I've always had high expectations. She, any time she said she was going to do something, she did it. And so when it became clear that she was going to help other people, I thought, boy, this is going to be a wild ride because she's going to do things that, that other people wouldn't do. She's such a strong individual, and she's made such a commitment to herself and now to others to carry on and power through. And she's made it her mission to, to bring this to the forefront of the medical community. And I think in that way, everybody else who has this is lucky that she also has it. I'm on my bike again. Well, more correctly, we are on our bikes again. Together, we ride now to put a spotlight on relapsing polychondritis. So the next time you see us riding through your neighborhood, will you please think about relapsing polychondritis? Will you remember the deep pain Will you understand the confusion of those who face it? Maybe you can be the hands and voice of compassion. Maybe you can become the doctor who discovers a cure. But no matter what, know that we're riding with a purpose. We don't have all the answers, 
but we have purpose, and having purpose changes everything. For further information, please contact the Relapsing Polychondritis Awareness and Support Foundation at www.polychondritis.org.